Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, Legacy Studio and Live Drummer, Gordon Campbell. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, everyone? Yep, it's that time. Another episode of the Rich Redman Show coming to you from sunny Los Angeles. My co-host, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com is in Music City, USA, songwriting capital of the world. Jim, what is happening? What's the weather like? Are you, what's, what's going on, man? Catch me up. It is um, overcast. Ugh. About 68 degrees. Beautiful weekend. Well, I'm sure our... Um, our guest today, he can, he, he can agree with me that it is sunny and 70 out here and there is really no need for a weatherman or a weather girl. They can save some money there. I tell you what, though, like all the weather people in, in L.A. are like just, just like supermodels. Have you noticed that? It's really hilarious. I guess yeah. it's the, this is the goal to come out here and just go, yep, it's sunny and 70 again. Have a great weekend. Yes. Jim, we're going to have an amazing conversation. You hear this gentleman, he's already, he's so, he's wired, he's fresh he's off energy. a cleanse, he's got all this energy. I was um, on a hike too, I went hiking today, <laughs> out of Running Canyon. That's already? Oh yeah, I'm ready to go. You got it in, I got my run in today too, man, because uh, it's, you got to get a piece of that sunshine. Since 1993, Jim, this gentleman has been a top call Angelino drummer. He's played with the likes of Earth, Wind & Fire, George Duke, Herbie Hancock, Stanley Clark, Mary J. Blige, Jessica Simpson. He's done the American Idol tour. He's done some work for the Mass sin Singer. He's also a composer, a band leader, plays a little organ, slaps the bass. He's got a great studio over in North Hollywood. I've driven past it like like 5,000 times, and then a couple weeks ago, we finally got to connect there. Our friend, Gordon Campbell. What's up, buddy? What's up, man? How's it going? Oh, man, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, both you guys, Jim and Rich. Thanks for having well, me. Well, thank you, man. Jim is, uh, you know, Jim is a longtime friend, and he does voiceover, and he produces podcasts. He's got a, a lighting business, but he's always had the drum bug. He's always been a drummer, was mm -hmm. a big fan of Neil and Stewart and Carter and all like the late 80s, early 90s guys. So yep. we have so much in common, so much that we can talk about. Right, for sure. Right, man. So yeah. you were just telling me, Gordon, that you were just finishing up this um, – serious sleep deprivation deadline as a composer yep. and there's a lot of drummers out there they never even think about picking up another musical instrument didn't you start on the organ was did you playing the well, keys i didn't start on the organ i started on drums they told me i don't remember when i started playing drums it's just i just always play but That's they told me i was five when i started and they have a picture of me sitting on a toy drum set for christmas when i was five so i was always i was a drummer first but so shortly after that, uh, growing up in my grandfather's church in Newburgh, New York, I just started playing piano. All my mom's side, well, my mom and dad's side, they're all, it's a lot of pastors in my family. So all of their kids play. If you're a pastor, usually your kids do something in the church and it's usually music. So because of that, my grandfather, my mom's side was the pastor of the church. I grew up in Newburgh. All of my aunts and uncles, out of 13 kids, at least seven of them were like proficient organists. Wow. So I had no choice but to play keys, and I was just around them, you know. And at one point, I became probably junior high school. My uncles that were playing at the church kind of stopped coming, and they knew I could play a little bit. So I was, like, forced on the organ, like, get on. And I was like, I don't know how to play the pedals. And they were like, doesn't matter. You can, you can do it. Because I would play the piano, and it was an upright. So I would hide behind the piano and play chords. And the organ was, like, right out front because, you know, back then it was organ and drums. It was not even a bass or guitar at my church at that point. Wow. So I was, yeah, so I had to play the pedals. I had to play, you know. So organ came second. Organ and keys came second to drums, but yes. But what a, what a, I mean, a great thing because uh, a piano and an organ, it's melody, harmony, and rhythm. So if you want to do arrangements, you want to compose, you got to create a string part. I mean, that's, I'm sure, something that you're saying to yourself, man, I'm so glad I have these skill sets. Exactly, exactly. It's paying off. <laughs> For yeah, sure, it's man. paying off. So yeah. when you say everybody in your family was a pastor, this is really incredible because there is so much uh, rhythm in when a pastor speaks and they give their, their, their what, what, do you, what do you call it, their sermon on yeah. Sunday morning. There's a rhythm to that thing. There's a rhythm to playing the drums. You, do you see that commonality? I mean, that's... Yes, very much so. I was literally was just listening to something, um, 
some talk radio on Sirius XM on the way here to my studio today. Yeah. And they were talking about the Aretha Franklin um, special that just came on last night on Nat Geo. Now it's on Hulu. I actually played drums on a bunch of the cues for that show. So really? I got to watch it tonight. Oh, but nice. Courtney B. Vance played Aretha's father, who was a preacher. And they were literally talking about how preachers talk, how Martin Luther King, all of them, there, there's a cadence to what they say. And in the black church. Even Jesus. Exactly. No. In the black church, once they start, we call it tuning up, the organist has to follow the preacher. So you figure out what key they're in, like, da, 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 boom, da, 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 da. so you have to, it's so improv, you have to be able to follow. And you got to know what key. And if you get, like, my grandfather wasn't a singer, but he would tune up. He would change keys, like, in the middle of a sentence. So our ears became, like, he can be like, da, 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 and we go, da, da, da. Like, I have to change keys with him. On or Yeah, so, yes. Wow. So you, you have to be, like, kind of well-versed, and your ears have to be kind of on point. But, yeah, that rhythmic thing is, is seriously a, it's a thing. Yeah, and, and it's, it's the, the number three always seems to come to mind when it comes to, like, motivational speaking, church sermons, and even comedy, like the rhythm of comedy. It's like, and God said, and God said, and then, and then there's a punch, you know? Yeah. And then the same thing with comedy where it's like, cake, cake, biscuit, you know, right hook, right hook, left hook. And then in drumming, we cake, got cake, biscuit. I don't know. It's, well, it's two of the same. And then something right. that comes out of the blue that you don't expect because you're expecting cake a third time and we hit you with a biscuit. Bam. Yeah. Yeah. What's the, what's the one? Uh, uh, there's actually a video out there. I'm looking it up. Is my king? And um, what's the guy's name? Jim S. M. Always, Lockridge. What is it? S. M. Lockridge. Jesus, that's my king. Is called. And basically, he just kind of goes through the whole thing about Jesus being, you know, he's imperial powerful. He's a morally graceful. He's like he's, he's speaking, but it's, he might as well be singing the thing. I that's mean, true. it's amazing to listen to. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and it'll, I, it'll make the, the hair I always stand tell up motivational and... speakers to, to to study preachers because you know they yeah. really do. They man, it's a, it's a it's a cadence to it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So now, so you're kind of in upstate New York, and yeah. then you're did you're playing since as far back as you can remember, and yeah. then you go to Howard University. Did you major in music? Yeah, I was a jazz studies major. Okay, see, let's. I really like, want to go to Berkeley in Boston. Yeah. And um, I just assumed my, uh, one of my uncles, one of my mom's brother went to Berkeley. He played piano. Um, uh, he went to Berkeley. So I was like, I want to go to Berkeley in Boston. It's not yeah. too far from Newburgh. It's maybe three hours or something from Boston. Um, and then one of my cousins from Silver Spring, Maryland was like, you ever think about Howard University? And I was like, no, nah, I never thought about it. And he said, you know, it's a historically black college, you know, but it's just a little bit of everybody. But it's in the middle of Washington, D.C. It's a great. So I was like, all right. So I think it might have been a little cheaper than Berkeley at that point. And a cousin of mine drove me from New York down to D.C. And I saw the campus and I saw all the little women and it was over. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, not trying to be whatever, but it was like 13 to one. And it's super. Howard is like the fashion school, yeah. like everybody's yeah. dressed. And um, then so you, I found out everybody you, had, that, you were practicing, you were practicing. Yes, yes. Yeah, but did, looking back on it, would have would Berkeley have helped you, do you think? Yes, but it's the true. reason I am where I am today is because of Howard University. Now, why do you say that? Who was the teacher there? Well, there was a couple. I studied with Grady Tate. Oh, my um, God. Okay. Yeah. Grady lived in New York, but he would come down once a month. And it was probably four straight ahead drummers. Chris yep. Dave. I'm sure you know Chris Dave. Yeah. A guy named Mark Prince and Aaron Walker. We were the, probably the main four jazz drummers in the school. And um, he would come down and teach us. He would stay for a week. He also taught vocals because he Grady was an incredible jazz singer. Wow. So some he would like basically give us lessons once a, once a month. And then I studied with Tom Jones. And um, why can't I think of the other guy's name? He was my main teacher for a while. He was a principal timpanist in the Kennedy Center uh, Orchestra. That's nice. I'm going blank on his name, and that's terrible. That's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll put it in my the show notes. For like three years, and then Tom Jones came. And then, but Grady would come once, like almost like a master class, but it would be private lessons with Grady. Yeah. Okay. So and, it was pretty, and, pretty And amazing. now you're mentoring and doing that same thing. I don't know how long you've been, you and I are both teaching at the Musicians Institute in Hollywood. How long have you yeah. been doing that? Since 2016. Okay, nice. Yeah. 
yeah, you were teaching but, in person because I remember doing, I know I did a drum clinic in February of 2020 and you were kind enough to be in the audience. I always like it when some of the faculty is out there. Yeah. Um, and then the apocalypse hit, you know, it was exactly. like this whole, and we're teaching online exactly. and um, it's so fun to be sh shaping a future generation of kids. Yeah, yeah. I got to a point, not to skip ahead, that I just got tired of touring with a lot of, with everybody. Yeah. And I, and I wanted to produce and I got this studio and I was like, you know what, I'm going to stay home. So yeah. I just stayed home. I wasn't thinking about teaching, but I would do a clinic like you every once in a while at MI. They would, Fred Dinkins would uh, have me come in or Stuart um, would have me come in. And after my clinic, I really actually got offered two jobs. One of my friends, Stacy, is the, uh, she's the chair of the music business department at MI. Nice. So she was at my clinic for a while and she left and was like, I got to go, but check your phone. So this is in the middle of my clinic. So I was like, all right. And then afterwards, as I'm, you know, afterwards you're speaking to the students, whatever, they're all lined up and you're talking to them. Stuart walks in between them and was like, you want to teach here? <laughs> he literally asked me like at the end of my clinic, I yeah. think he liked the way I just talk to the students and the way I broke stuff down. Sure. Um, so he offered me a job. And then later I looked at my text and Stacy was like, do you want to teach here? And I'm like, did you guys talk Stacy? And, <laughs> and they were like, no, both of them offered me to teach at MI after that clinic. They must've been oh. one. That was, I mean, I'm sure anytime you're behind a set of drums, it's great. But what, what is sometimes makes the difference is that not everyone that has your ability and experience can break things down and be effectively communicating to someone right. else. Some guys just can't do it. I had to learn that. I didn't realize that. They were like, no, the way you explain it just makes sense. I didn't realize that that everybody couldn't do it. <laughs> so I went to a couple <laughs> clinics and I was like, oh, yeah. When a student goes, well, how'd you play that? And they were like, well, I just, and they couldn't necessarily break it down. So yeah. I would attribute that to, for me, starting in fourth grade, I started taking lessons. I was already playing in church, like playing full services. In fourth grade, I could already play yeah. drum set, but I didn't know how to read or anything. So by fourth grade, back then, you pick an instrument if you want to be in band. I picked drums. So I was reading since then, all through elementary, high school, junior high school, college. So I was always reading. So I was always analyzing what other drummers were doing. Even when I was learning by ear, I would listen, yeah. especially a lot of the gospel stuff, because none of that's written down. I would just listen and copy it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I went to, to, to I went, I tried to do a deep dive on the guests and uh, I went to drummerworld.com and I was checking out some of your videos and there's some performances of you with like George Duke. And then of course, I remembered that the reason I ended up meeting you one year at the Percussive Arts Society is that we both created an educational product with Eric Doris co-producing and directing. Exactly. He directed yep. a DVD that you put out a couple of years back, Secrets of a Working Drummer. Yeah. That is incredible. And you've got some solos on there that just build out of just, just light snare drum playing. And before you know it, there's a couple of tom notes poking through. There's a short stack hit and things are getting more dense and they're, you're soloing over the vamp. And it's, yeah. uh, you know how to do it, man. I mean, Thank it you. is fantastic. Thank you. I mean, I, yeah. Literally, had to break me into like, yo, man, what are you doing? Like, don't do that, you know? And that's why I put that DVD out. I really wanted – a lot of guys have a lot of talent, and especially a lot of gospel guys get a bad rep, rap for overplaying and over – that's kind of like a style. That's not necessarily all gospel is, but we're known for that. A lot of people just haven't had anybody hone that, like, that, that diamond, like, break it down. I had somebody – I was in bands where people were like, yo – you know, for years, I was the baby in the band. Earth, Wind & Fire to George, everybody. They would interview me. And the baby of the band, you know, I'm in my early <laughs> 20s. You know, so they would talk, bring me to the side and break me down. Like, look, don't do that there. Or do you realize when you do this? So they taught me music. And even when, other, when somebody else is soloing, how to play behind them. I played in the band in D.C., uh, this guy named uh, Larry Seals, LS, uh, was it LSG? I can't think. LSQ, that's what it was called, Larry Seals Quartet. <laughs> his brother was a drummer before me. His brother was an incredible drummer. So all the tapes that I learned from, back then it was cassette tape. I was like, who is the drummer? He's like, that's my brother. So when I came in, I'm a young student at Howard, probably a sophomore, when I started playing. And he was like, look, man, when you do this, don't do that. When I'm starting, he's a sax player. When I'm starting my solo, don't be big. Like, break down. Like, he made me think. Spop. Yes, break it down, build up. When you do your solo, you don't have to blaze the whole time. Play ideas, you know. 
So a lot of it I learned from not just drummers, but other musicians that like he would Larry Seals a couple times had me wanting to quit. Like yeah. I'm thinking I'm killing. We used to do a gig at a restaurant and people would be like, Oh my God. And then he'd be like, let me talk to you. <laughs> I'm like, uh -oh. <laughs> I go home with a stomach ache. Like, you know what? I'm quitting. I'm quitting. I don't have it. But you but did it. I would come back next week and play what he said. And he would stop playing and be like, yeah. And turn back around and keep playing. He was, a, he's a bad dude. So it took somebody like breaking me down to be like, okay, it's got to make sense. Well, you know? well, well, and poss possibly you've been doing this for so long at such a high level, 93, mm -hmm. you know, the landscape of the music business was completely different. You know, stylistically things were happening. It was a healthier time in the music business. I'm sure if you're working with Tyrese, Brownstone, SWV, Wayne, Br you, you got some, there's some dancers as well, right? Yeah. And so you can't be blazing the whole time when you got no. dancers, right? No. You can't blaze pretty much most of the time. <laughs> the yeah. blaze for us, for those gigs like that, I would like look for a space that was just nothing going on, like coming out of a bridge, going into like the last chorus or something, where I, I would look for a space, all right, I can do something here. And it wasn't necessarily blaze. It was a lot of times it's just stylistically that's what fit yeah. that song, you know, and I, I would find a spot Every, everywhere else. It's meat and potatoes, especially on those big tours where there's lights and there's cues, like you said, and there's dancers. You got to play the same thing every night. It can't really go yeah. too far out because it's going to throw them off. Yeah. You know, even so back, I've done yeah. stuff with Jessica Simpson where I did something and she just started giggling. I was like, OK, note to self, never do that again because it <laughs> threw her off a little bit. And she just she was cool. So she just laughed and was like, OK. <laughs> but I, in my in my mind, I was like, "Don't play that again," because it threw her off. And it wasn't like a blaze lick. I might have turned the beat around or something on a groove. But whatever yeah. it is, she was just like, "Whoa!" <laughs> so <laughs> it depends on the gig, the song, the artist, everything, you know. But those type of gigs, yes, I would find a spot. Like, all right, this is wide open. I can do something here. Yeah. And the rest of the time, it's just like, and we're playing with a drum machine too, with kick, snare, everything in the drum machine. So you got to lock with that drum machine. I remember, yeah, it was like when I was playing in, in bands in Dallas and it was like we were doing Janet Jackson and Coolio and all that kind of stuff. We had to learn right. all the tunes, of the SWV, all the tunes of the day. Right. And um, basically just took my Alesis and then my drum cat, and then a couple of Yamaha sequencers with floppies. And I was programming like... Yeah. Heavy hand claps and stuff. And you just got to lock with that stuff. You got to lock. You know, you can't, you can't be all over the place with with the with the loop. <laughs> you yeah. know, so. and that has not gone away. It really, really hasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I remember when we were hanging at your studio a couple weeks back, you were nice enough to to to, to provide your space to Eric and Jillian, the filmmakers for the Give yeah. Me a Beat documentary. We just had them on the show. We were just talking okay. about the, oh, nice. the documentary. So Gordon's going to be in that. His best friend Taku's going to be in that. Like a lot yeah. of great Angelino drummers are going to be in that. Um, you and I were talking about gospel chops drummers, and I don't even know if that's an offensive term, but you were talking about potentially breaking that down or doing a YouTube video or doing a documentary or something and talking about yeah. some of the, the OGs and where you guys got that stuff from. Tell us a little yep. bit about that. So, yes, I am doing a documentary. I'm still in the beginning stages, and I, I started doing it. I had the idea, and then – people talked me into doing an album. So I had to like put that off to the side, but now the album's done. So now I'm going to do it. But my concept is a lot of people know the gospel chops guys of today, but they don't necessarily know the history. Like if you say jazz, even at MI, the class that I was teaching was gospel and R&B drumming. So most of the time cats will come in because a lot of cats want to learn the licks. They want to learn all of the, the fancy stuff and the linear fills, which is mostly based off of, and I was like, we'll learn some of that, but this is more about history of gospel music, where it started, how it started, who the main guys were. So even if you go to Drummer World for the longest time, he has it now, but for the longest time, Bernard, there was, they have like ladies of jazz, the R&B guys, jazz pioneers, rock guys, all these guys and nothing gospel. And they had gospel guys on there like Teddy Campbell, Nissan, and we play other stuff, but we grew up playing gospel. But it wasn't where we came from. So I always said I want to do a documentary so people can actually know the real history and the names of guys. Like I'd be at NAMM and Joel Smith would be walking around and nobody would know who he is. Like Joel Smith to us is like Vinny. If Vinny or Dennis Chambers is walking through the drum area, 
they cannot take one step without 50 people lining up to talk to them. Right. Joe Smith was just walking through saying hi. To, nobody, not even the companies knew. Joe Smith is the reason all of us play the way we do. Any gospel guy that grew up in church, he is the guy from the Hawkins, from Oh Happy Day. He didn't play on Oh Happy Day, but that's his family. He right. played drums and bass on like all of the hit records for years. So was was he the first, was he like stylistically, what was he doing? Was he breaking up the linear thing between? Everything that everybody's doing right now, he was yeah. doing that in the 70s and the 80s. And he just died four or five years ago. Uh -huh. So like Calvin Rogers, me, Teddy, if you ask any of us, Aaron Spears, well, everybody would say Joe. Joe was like the number one. He was playing. And I actually got the chance to interview him before he passed for the doc. Um, and he said that he listened to Steve Gadd and Harvey Mason. And then on bass, he listened to Chuck Rainey. Those were his idols. And he literally practiced like 10 hours a day, like drums five hours, bass five hours. Like even when he had school, he would work it out when he was, you know, still in school. Um, but Joel is the guy. And a lot of people don't know who he is. So I was like, man, unless we tell our own story, nobody's going to know that Joel is the reason that, you know, there's other guys, but like pretty much ask anybody. I think that's going to be great. Like his, I think that's going to be a his his. If I I'll send you some stuff of Joe yeah. playing the stuff he's playing, so ahead of its time. Play. Yeah, yeah, literally, and he's playing bass and drums on most of the records. Like a lot of gospel records, they would cut live, like at a church. So he would play drums live, go to the studio and play the bass. You know, so it was locked because it's him playing with himself, bass he, and drums. Right, he's playing with himself. That's uh, it, it's incredible. It's wow. incredible. So, um, yeah, so I just think people need to know who he is. And, you know, and then there's people like Dana Davis from the Winans from Detroit. Um, there, I mean, there's so many guys. Yeah. And I just happened to know him just because I came up listening to him. And then when I started touring, when I got to that city, I would call him like, hey, I'm in town with such and such. You know, can we meet up? And I just met, would start meeting up with people. And I just stayed in touch. Bill Maxwell, who's another guy, um, he's an L.A. guy, actually. He started with Andre Crouch, um, oh, and wow. he's a white guy. So I interviewed him, and he was saying how back in the late early 70s with Andre Crouch, for one, gospel, you couldn't use drums in church because it was thought of as, like, music that they played at a juke joint at a club or something. So you it couldn't was, use rhythm section instruments and gospel music. It was like a no-no. So yeah. when he started playing with Andre, there was still a lot of racism. So they would go places. He said, I can go in the front door because I was white. The rest of the choir, the group had to go through the back. But he said, we would get to churches and they're like, you can sing, but he's not bringing that drum set in here. And Andre Crouch, who's like one of the fathers of gospel music, was like, if he doesn't play, we're leaving. And they were like, all right, all right, you can bring the drums in. And that's one. So I ac actually interviewed Bill, too. And Bill's another composer who did the music for um, Jamie Foxx show. Wow. Martin Lawrence show. He was a composer for all these, but he's a drummer. So I looked up to him, and he produced a lot of records, a lot of famous gospel albums he produced and played drums on. So Andre Crouch was actually helped, like, it was a he forced change. Yeah, big yeah. time. So you'll hear all of this in the, in the documentary. Well, I think that's going to be a welcome addition to the percussion world. But tell us about this solo record. This is your first re uh, solo record as a yeah. solo artist. Yep. So, Sounds great. You sent me a copy. Oh. And I, was, I mean, it's, are you singing? Is that you singing? On I'm singing background, okay. but I, I'm not a singer. So you that's hired your friends to my, sing, and you yes, composed all the tracks. Yes. One of my pet peeves is when people try to do an album that are musicians, and they sing. They, to me, I mean, if you can sing, you can sing. I just know my lane. I can sing. It's like two songs I'm singing background. If you listen really hard, you can hear me singing background, but I'm no. I have a lot of famous friends that have, for one, it's a couple different things. I know that if you get certain names on your album, for instance, if you do an album and Jason Aldean is on there, his whole audience is going to already come. Right, so right. business-wise, I'm like, I need, I have a lot of connections. I'm just going to call them and see if they want to sing on it. They can write with me and we'll split the publishing so they have some incentive because I didn't pay any of them. I paid one person, and I'm not even going to say who that was. Pay, you paid them, with, uh, paid them with intellectual property. Yeah, I paid them cash. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody else just came because we're just friends and I've worked with them over the years or even if I never worked with them, we're just friends. So I call some of my people that have kind of big names in R&B and soul music um, already. So I said that'll help my record, but it'll also, you know, make me people hear my production. It's just going to open up other doors yeah, and they now, can sing. <laughs> so now who are some of those names? 
that you have. All right. So some of the names on the album, Sheila E is not singing. She's playing. Nice. But Sheila E, um, PJ Morton, who's killing the game right now on soul music side. He's also a member of uh, Maroon 5. He's a keyboard player in Maroon oh, 5. Oh, okay. I met him about maybe 11 years ago in a barn. Really? Um, he, Jason was having a party. It was like Jason, Kid Rock, Luke Bryan, and oh, wow. Maroon 5. Wow. And we were all just hanging out in a barn in Jason's backyard. Really? Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Haven't well, seen him since, though. Really? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. He's killing the game. His album, you look up PJ Morton, all his albums. He just got a Grammy. He, he does more R&B stuff, but he did a gospel album. And he just won a Grammy last week. Wow, that's great. Awesome. So he's got multiple Grammys from his stuff. And now he got one on the gospel side, too. But, um, yeah, he's, his studio used to be here in his complex. So I would see him every day. <laughs> so that's how we became cool. So him, BJ the Chicago Kid is another one, um, Def Jam artist that's uh, killing the game right now on the R&B, hip-hop side. B Slade is on the record. Um, Eric Dawkins. Angie Fisher, um, and then I have Kamasi Washington, who is killing the game on the jazz side. He's a saxophone player. He just got nominated for a couple Grammys. Um, Alex Isley, uh, who else? Peter Collins, Terrace Martin, my daughter, Morgan Campbell, who is a new artist. She's coming out. She's on the record. Nika awesome. Hamilton, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, interviews with Harvey Mason, well, well kind of interview slash conversation. Yeah, with Harvey Mason. I like the title, Conversations, and it had a nice flow to it. It was almost kind of thematic. Yes. There's like these little, you have like in between each track, you got like voicemails or conversations you're having with people. Yes. Yes. And the, the playing is killing, the writing is killing. So congratulations. What Thank are you, you. doing to, to, where can people find it? They just hit the Spotify's and the Apple Music's and all that? or All of that. Um, the best place to go if you want to support me is Bandcamp. <laughs> GordonCampbell.Bandcamp.com. They pay the highest rate of every anybody that's in the music pretty much knows that the streaming sites don't pay a lot mm. like uh, album sale like if you sold a cd you get way more money you get a higher percentage than if you if somebody streams your song or even if they buy it online the percentage is a lot lower yeah. Bandcamp pays the highest rate um for online streaming or and you get a higher uh it's 28 uh i mean 48k instead of 44 so the, oh. the resolution, it sounds better. It sounds more like a CD yeah. on Bandcamp. So Bandcamp.com or Apple Music or my website, GordonCampbell.com, will connect you to my Bandcamp. Um, and that's, that's the best cool. way. Bandcamp is cool, too, because uh, it's almost like a Facebook. They can leave me a message. Um, I can respond. Like, it's directly to your fans, basically. I like that, man. Yeah, if I, I have merch, which I have merch soon. They can buy merch on there. I can let them know once we start playing out again, I'll be in Connecticut this day at, you know, Toad's Place or some place that, I don't know, yeah. Toad's over there now, but, you know. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to MusiciansMortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS number 39179. NMLS consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. So you're gonna have you're gonna have merch, and so before you know it, some guy's gonna be walking around with a Gordon Campbell shirt, 
and then 20 years okay. from now, that ratty tatted shirt is going to be for sale in some high end vintage t shirt right. store for five hundred dollars. We're going to make an NFT out of it and sell it. I don't know if you're in the NFTs yet. That's what the is that? Non fungible tokens. It's a new wave right now. That every well, not everybody. Wait, it's like cryptocurrency. It's crypto, but it's art. People are selling their art. You make it a to like something that's exclusive. Um, Kings of Leon just put out their album like that recently and they're getting this dj for instance i mean a producer did a live stream and made it a token a non an nft he made seventy five thousand dollars in one day of people buying it and then when people resell it you get a percentage of the resale so Jim, i gotta did look you know up about this man. i have no idea uh, yeah man look up nft it's the new wave so i'm actually gonna nft my album because kings of leon just did it. i don't know how much they made they were somebody just mark cuban from the dallas uh mavericks did an NFT for, I think it was a t-shirt and he just was getting into it. Cause somebody's like, you got to do this. He made $90,000 in 10 minutes, literally 10 minutes. He had $90,000 mm. worth of crypto. I'm still having it's trouble crazy. wrapping my head around Bitcoin. Yeah. I'm getting into all of that, but, yeah, but is it too late? Or, Cause it's too late to get in Bitcoin. Do we miss the window? No, no. no. Now if you get in early and this is what I learned during this pandemic too, whatever's cracking like that, the earlier you get in, the better chance you have. Of, you got to kind of have vision of the seeing what's going to blow up and what's not. Would you say the Bitcoin at, at this point is like the internet in 1996? Um, more like 2000. Mm. Bitcoin mm -hmm. five years ago was like it in 1996. Because yeah. <laughs> everybody that got into Bitcoin five years ago made a lot of money, like hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Like even now, I just bought some Bitcoin and, and it already doubled. I just, I bought maybe I had like thirty dollars just sitting in my Cash App of Bitcoin, and it's like worth like sixty dollars now. Huh. <laughs> like literally double. So well, if say I put a thousand dollars in, it'd be two thousand. You know what I mean? So what's yeah. one share of it? Like if I wanted to get into this game, I've never done it's that. one Bitcoin. It's, yeah, it's like forty grand. One Bitcoin is no, it's like fifty something. It was 50. last week. It got up. To, $56,000, one Bitcoin. But the cool thing is you can buy a fraction. So I own a fraction of it. It's like 0. 0.00000. But one, it, go, it goes up and down every day, like foreign currency. currency. So it's, it's another stock like trading. My $30 kind of doubled to $60. Yeah. If I put $10,000, now I have 20000 You know what I'm saying? Mm. So it's all about how much you invest and where you put it. But because of the rate keeps going higher and higher. And Bitcoin is not the only crypto. Yeah. There's like Ethereum. There's a bunch of different ones. That's lower. Bitcoin is like the, the, the face of it. That's the biggest. But last week, it was up to $56,000 for one coin. Wow. It's a lot of money. But NFTs are all kind of part of that thing. And it start, I think, I don't know if it started out with art, but a lot of people are just making art. I was on a clubhouse last night, and this girl was like, yeah, she has butterflies, like digital butterflies, like a picture of a butterfly. You make it digital. You make it an NFT. And people just buy it. You go on these different sites like shareable.com, a couple other sites that will like, it's almost like a mall. Like you go into this mall and you get a, a kiosk and you sell your stuff because they already have shoppers, people that buy NFTs. They were about to sell, I think it was Elon Musk first, his first tweet. And it, I, they didn't do it for whatever reason. They were some, Somebody was going to buy it for like $69 million. They NFT this tweet. You can look at, just look up NFT, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or somebody, and you'll see yeah. it's like it's millions of dollars of people like bidding on this stuff. It's crazy. Well, that's the funny thing is that they're talking about it being an alternative currency, but yet at the end of the day, everybody's trading it in for dollars. You know. Well, that's and, the thing. Like eventually, yeah. you, and that's what my friend was like. Well, how do you get it? Like, for instance, I bought Bitcoin on my Cash App. I can just say transfer it to my bank. I just transfer it like I transfer cash. And it yeah. turns into cash in my bank. And whatever the equivalent is that day, that's how much I get. So say I have $30. If it goes up to $60, once I transfer it, I got $60 in my account when I put $30 in. I, so, don't, I don't know why I can't wrap my head around it. I just can't. I don't know why. I can. I see I, I'm, 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 I'm glad you can, but I, I, I just can't. <laughs> well, you're I investing in something that's not tangible. It's right. yeah. The thing about it is it's not regulated by any yeah. country or state. 
So but dollar, the everything true is value negative. of it is still in dollar valuation. I mean, it's, uh, right. you know, so I mean, that's where they still have the control over it, you know, until right. Bitcoin is used to buy stuff on Amazon, then what do we, you know, what do we use it well, for? Well, no, it's going there. It's going there. Yeah, I bet it countries is. Countries are getting to where you can buy real estate, everything. It, it's going to be, you can buy anything in crypto soon. But it's still tied to the dollar, though, dollar, dollar valuations, because that's how people understand it and process right. it. Right. But the same thing as the dollar. The dollar is tied mm-hmm. to gold. No, it's not. The not gold. since the 70s. <laughs> 60s, 70 got off the gold standard. Ron Paul really? wants it back on. Right. It's, so, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a faux, what do they call it? A um, faux currency, um, fiat currency. That's what right. it is. So it's, um, to me, it's almost the same thing. Just like they can just print up more dollars. Yeah. What is it connected to? Like, it's nothing to our mind and we, yeah exactly. we've got a stimulus that's basically printing more money yes so so to me but it turns into money if you yeah. transfer to your bank it will be dollars so that's i, I that's as deep as i go with it, it yeah so yeah. so so if if i had gotten into this five or six years ago i do have friends that have made millions from investing yeah, a very small amount five years ago exactly yeah. So that's the thing is, is it too late? I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to spend 50 grand for one share. That's crazy. No, what There's you, the, do, you buy a piece. Yeah. Yeah. Even like stocks, like I'm not necessarily buying a stock. I might buy, and I'm just getting into stocks with the crypto. I'm just buying a, a piece of it. And then I use that money to keep building. So I have enough money to buy a share and then, you know, go from there. Uh, Here's the thing is that if, if crypto currency is like the internet sans late 90s early 2000s bitcoin is maybe like the aol if you look at it that way mm-hmm. which means that there might be other cryptos that come up and you know trump aol because you're now you're going to have your dot com type of phenomenon that goes Crash. on um you're going to have your amazons your price remember priceline.com yeah. that was huge in back in the day um you have a, a lot of other Bitcoins you could actually look into. I've actually got money in XRP, Ripple. Okay, yeah. That's, I bought it at $3. Now it's down, now it's down to, you know, 14 cents. Yeah, so, it'll go up. Yeah. So I, I, I basically tell Bitcoin. people, I say, look, you know, I'm getting into the stock market, so make sure you get out. Because um, <laughs> typically <laughs> when I get in is when it goes down. Right. Get a, yeah. Yeah. So, but when it's down is the best time to buy, and you just yeah. be in it for the long haul. Yeah, you know. So my thing, me, I'm going to wait for the next real estate bubble to burst and buy real estate. That's it too. Real estate, yeah. is, man, is heavy. So yeah. what I'm doing is surrounding my people, surrounding myself with people that really know how it works. Yes, and it's almost like getting the inside shot on this. And we need to really do this because this is going to pop in ten years. You don't see it now, but and I just got to trust them, and I'm willing. To, I'm not going to spend money that I got to pay my bills on, but if I have anything extra. I'm willing yeah. to invest and take 10 the years is a long time to wait. Talk about the patience game. But if you can, yeah. if you can get $500,000 to wait to, you know, and, and that's just side money. That's like a side. That's not, you know, yeah. my main. Yeah. It's worth it. You know, if you can, uh, yeah, surround yourself with the right people for sure. Um, and also, uh, listening to the podcasts. I, I tell, I, I was on a podcast the other day as a guest and somebody said, what can people do to really change how kids think? I said, dude, there's a whole education out there on podcasts. I mean, some of the world's biggest influencers and, and thought leaders are giving away their information. Yep. Exactly. And you can just sit there and listen to episode after episode and absorb it all. Marinate your mind in good stuff. Yeah. That's so, what I'm doing. Yeah. YouTube. I'm on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Daily. You know, even with the NFTs, I said, um, I'm, this week I'm going to deep dive into like the basics of NFTs. And I know people that are already doing it. And the clubhouse that I'm in, the, uh, you know about Clubhouse, the app? Yeah, I, I was invited like four months ago, and I'm on there, but I haven't spent the time. Listen, I think you do very well. Room, there's a bunch of rooms. Yeah. So it depends on who you follow, what you get out of it. There's a bunch of millionaire mindset type people, and yeah. these people are already like freaking millionaires. Some are faking, some are lying, but some are mm. le- legitimately teaching. But MC Hammer is part of the movement of NFTs for musicians. Oh, wow. So like all these, yeah. like the thing about clubhouses is you can be in a room with anybody, like all the famous people that you can think of, they're all on clubhouse. So you're literally in the same room and you're listening to them talk. And MC Hammer is seriously on the NFT train right now. And he's like, artists, because we're not touring right now, 
make an NFT, make something ex exclusive, put out your single, but only have 10 with the, the added 32 bars at the end that nobody else hears, make it exclusive. And then people want it because it's exclusive. They buy it. So Hammer, I'm trying to think who else is on that call. So what's, what's the there. price for the NFT? Can you set the price or are people, is it like Patreon? Or what, I don't even know yet. That's what oh. I have to do my deep dive. I just know that they're putting it out and they're making money. So now yeah. I got to do my research for myself with the podcast. And there's a lot of YouTubes. Um, and a friend of mine is into it too. So he's been sending me these videos. Just watch that and learn. So Yeah, because the curse, the curse of putting out great music i mean it's it's such a great presentation i mean you look great on the cover like you wrote the songs you got all your friends the playing is world class you know in this time if you're not able to go out and tour and sell t-shirts and take the music to the people you know these little gems um just can die in obscurity which yeah. is horrible yep you so know? one thing i have to do and i don't know if you know sput robert sput see right he was a drummer from Snarky Puppy. He's the original drummer in Snarky. That's and right. now he left. He has a band called Ghost Note. And wow. he also he also MDs a Zildjian Live that they do at NAMM every year. Okay. He's a, he's playing keys, but he's a drummer. He's like, we're all kind of the same. We all play yeah. keys and drums. Yeah. And he writes all of those songs, all those arrangements for Zildjian Live with all the drummers, Ash Sloan and wow. Gergo and Dennis. Sput does all that. So Spud's like my little brother. We've been knowing each other since we were 12, whatever. He went to North Texas. North, He's from um, Dallas. But uh, he's doing so many different live events. They did something recently here with, with Ghost Note, and they brought in a couple people. They have a huge following, and they're still playing live. And all they do is put their cash app or whatever. So that's what I have to do. I have to be more proactive about playing live. I did one here in the beginning of COVID, and we called it Six Feet Apart at the jam session. And it was just me, a couple guys in my band, and we spread out and played, and we made a little bit of money. So I got to just do more lives and yeah. um, stuff like that to keep playing. I just haven't been proactive about it. But, yes, it can get lost in the sauce. And um, so I'm actually looking for management now um, and a, a publicist to get me in the game. I'm getting played on, like, Sirius XM. That's um, great. I just signed with a company. Huh? I said, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Dave Koz just featured me on his um, Sunday show. Um, his Smooth Jazz Sunday show, one of my songs. And it's a, it's a series he does every Sunday called From Sideman to Star. So nice. he did like a whole speech on me and seeing me around playing with all the smooth jazz artists. And we did something a while ago back in COVID at Rick Braun's house. He does a YouTube and we, I got to play with Dave. And that's what we talked about it. Um, and he said, I'm going to put you on my show. And he actually did. I love so, that Dave yeah. Cos, man. He seems like such a nice guy. I love his music. He, he's just such he's a really nice guy. a man of his word. Like he said he would do it and he literally yeah. did it. He was like, he was apologizing to me for taking so long. This was probably maybe June or July last year when we yeah. talked and my album didn't come out to November. So I sent him to him in November and maybe three weeks ago he featured me and he's like, I'm sorry it took so long. I'm like, bro, I'm happy that you did it this quick. Like, hey, yeah. It's That's cool. great. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it's different things going on. I'm going to do more content, too, if I can help anybody. Content is king right now. That's so, for sure. I have all kinds of behind-the-scenes footage of recording my album with all the different artists, different studios. Some I did here. Some I did at NRG around the corner. So, I have, I'm have. i going to start putting that together and just putting it out. Every time I post something, more people buy my album. So. Well, you're, I mean, you're, the, your place looks great, sounds great. You do a lot of composing there. You yeah. know, we were talking about you playing keys, and then right before we started the, um, the interview, we were talking about all these deadlines you had because you were doing all these compositions that included playing bass, doing all the string arrangements. Yeah. So you would, I'm sure, recommend that for drummers to get their skill set together on that thing. Yeah, I yeah. always, even my students when I'm teaching, I'm like, learn a different instrument. Learn something melodic because you hear differently. A lot of times when people have seen me play over the years, people walk up all the time and go, you play another instrument, don't you? And I'm like, how could you tell for me on the drum? They was like, I could just tell. I think it's because I'm listening and I'm hearing what I might play on keys or what I might play on bass or it just open my, opens my ears to chord structure and I might hear a diminished chord and that's going to make me swell on the cymbal as opposed to if you don't know that. You know, most of us naturally will know what to do, yeah. but... I think when you play another instrument, musically, you kind of hear where it's going to go, and you can kind of uh, navigate your drumming 
to fit that, to fit the music. Because my yeah. thing is, the music dictates what I play, not the other way around. So if it's a ballad or if it's soft, I'm going to play soft. I'm not going to do a big fill when everybody's playing soft. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or in the first verse. it got to make sense. So because I play different instruments, I'm thinking all of this stuff as I'm playing. And I think it just makes me a more musical drummer. Absolutely, you know, man. I, today. I knew. I mean, I know I was just playing on your kit. Uh, it was my kit, but at your place. That was your kit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, I'm just thinking to myself, man, this guy is so good, and he's played with so many funky people. And I'm just sitting yeah. there just playing my little, you know, just playing a groove. And, I, and I'm just saying to myself, man, just hold this thing, man. You know, just anyway. hold. Don't do anything fancy. Anything fancy. Bro, that was fun hanging, it, man. It was funky. And that's what it is. And that's what, I mean, for me, and I tell a lot of drummers, like, believe it or not, even at MI, I have some students, I had one student tell me that, I'm like, well, what do you want to do career-wise? He said, I want to be a chops, like a YouTube drummer. That was his career, a wow. YouTube drummer. I've never heard that before, because all of us want to play with artists and go on tour and, yeah. or be artists ourselves. His thing was he wanted to do chops. I said, even the guys that you know that play chops, when you see them playing with an artist, which is pretty much our ultimate goal to make a living, yep. we're playing two and four. Like, we're not playing all of those chops on gigs. Like, yeah. it's just not musical. That's cool to have, and we all like to do it, and it's fun to watch and learn technically. But musically, for me, and it's not all about money, but I want to make a career out of this. In order to do that, i got to pay bills. Yeah. And to pay bills is just meat and potatoes, two and right. four. You know, now, when it's, I look it's fair when I get to open up like that. Speaking of that, if I'm looking at these at your resume and I'm seeing Earth, Wind and Fire and Mary J. Blige, those two right there are like holy grails of R and B funk soul music. Wow. What eras was that was that Earth, Wind and Fire? When when was that? Well, I played with Earth, Wind and Fire from nineteen ninety nine to two thousand and one. I did about three years. I came right after Sonny Emery. Nice. Was like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> I have been touring with Philip. Um, and this is another lesson I teach a lot of my students. A lot of the gigs I got was from being in L.A., playing at a club. I just ran a $100, $150 gig. Somebody came to that gig. And it's because L.A., everybody hangs out in L.A., all the producers, the artists, the MDs. And that's how you get hired, either from an MD mostly, an artist or a producer. That's how you get hired as a musician or a drummer. And they hang out where I was playing. So a lot of the gigs. So I was playing at a club every Wednesday, and this guy, Robert Brookins, would come sit in with us every week. And he was best friends with Philip Bailey. So when Derek Organ, who was playing with Philip, left, Philip wanted a drummer. Robert walked me right into Philip because that was his. He was like, I see him play every week at this little club. You should get him. So I played with Philip maybe three tours in Japan, three years in a row. And when Sonny was leaving, Philip just called me. Like, it, I didn't audition. It wasn't nothing. He was like, I want you to come do the gig because Sonny's leaving. <laughs> That's, and that, that was it. Did you ever uh, work with um, Vale Johnson, the bass player for Kenny G, 30 years? No. I know who Vale is. I never got a chance to play with him, though. Because he told us the same story, man. Every gig I got was from doing some little no-paying job somewhere. Yep. Jessica Simpson was the same. I was playing with uh, my boy Herman Jackson, who was MD, and, and we hadn't seen each other probably about two years. Because everybody, you know, touring and stuff. We all live in the neighborhood, but we see each other in passing. Yeah. So we did a gig at a club, 100 bucks. And he was like, hey, Jessica Simpson has two shows. You want to do the gig with her? And this was still the pop stuff. This is back in uh, 2004. She was still married to Nick Lachey and all that. Right. So I'm like, all right, I'll do it. So we did two shows. We rehearsed and everything. And he called me like, she really likes the band. She wants to do a tour. So anyway, long story short, it went from that to me playing with her from 2004 till 2009 when she did the country thing. And we ended up opening for, uh, for Rascal Flats that year. That's right, man. So I got to hang with Jim Riley and Travis Toy and all of those guys. That's right. And, and our steel that. player, Carl Ray Jackson. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, what? yeah. So, it, that was at a club. And that was, you know, it started from two gigs. And then she likes the band. She wants to do a tour. And then all through those years, I would be in and out. And then it ended up with me being the musical director because Herman was playing with uh, Ricky Minor doing American Idol. He couldn't leave. So he rehearsed us, and then when we went, he said, Gordon, you're going to have to MD. And I MD, we did a TV show run, and then we did the run with um, where I met you too. That's with right. Jason Aldean. At, I, it was like a giant it. festival in Florida. Not the Florida one. I met you there, but it was before that. It was in right outside of Chicago, not Milwaukee. 
it was an outdoor festival because all yeah. the guys in our band knew you and That's you were cool. with Jason Aldean. And, and I was like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. Yeah. I remember <laughs> you from that day. It was right outside of Chicago. It's cra uh, crazy. Um, maybe it was, um, I wonder if it was the Hollywood Casino Amphitheater in that area. There, there's like an amphitheater no. on the outskirts of Chicago. I, I don't think our outside. memory is good enough. It was an outside, just a, like a field. Yeah. I can't remember, but that's the day I remember meeting you. That it was day. just hay bales and wagon wheels, man. And, yeah, and all the guys in our band knew you. That's so crazy. I was like, oh, hey, man, you know, I like meeting drummers. You know drummers. Well. Oh, drummers. We're thick as thieves, man. Exactly. So that's, yeah. And you probably don't remember that day. I just remember, you know, and I was like, oh. And I I'm do not, remember it being outdoor and out. It yeah. was hot, and you had this gorgeous set of Yamaha drums. and Yes. <laughs> it was yeah. amazing. Hey, so Jim's got a question for you. He's going to ask you the random question of the day. Okay. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. <laughs> Gordon. Yes. What fad or trend have you never been able to understand? <laughs> um, sagging jeans. <laughs> <laughs> the sagging? You never did it? No, I can't. I do it at home, like, if I – most times now, I mean, fashions change, but I could just remember if I had a pant, some pants with belt with a belt on, and I got home and took the belt off, and they start falling down, and I'm, like, walking around the house. It's the most uncomfortable thing ever. It is. It's so unsettling. walk around all day like that, and I have friends that do it, and I see how they have to walk in order to – they have to walk literally like a cowboy. So sorry. Like a penguin. I'm a square, but I can't do that. There's a, that was actually, I believe, started from crisscross back in 1990. Actually, it was started in prison. That's <laughs> what guys did. No, seriously. That's what guys do when they're trying to, like, shake their tail feather in front of another guy and they, like, want some, some loving. Really? Yeah, that was like the, come on, that was like the flirt. If your pants are hanging down and you crack. So a lot of people don't know that, but that's where it originates. So the, even that, guys don't know that. Cool. I'm learning so much, Gordon. I know. Listen, this is the I'm most a history buff too. So <laughs> this is the I most insightful episode we've had in a long time. With sure. you know, learning about NFTs and NFTs Bitcoin. and crypto and prison <clears throat> jeans. Yeah. yeah. Holy. Cow. Even even and not not to not to down anybody, but even like no laces in the shoes. That's a prison thing. They take your laces so you can't hang yourself. You know what I'm saying? So, but we oh. always pick up a style. We do make it cool. I just like for that sagging jeans, it's just too uncomfortable for me. And yeah. I see yeah. guys even here because this is a studio. It's nothing but artists and producers walking. They're always pulling their pants. It's like an all day pull your pants up. I can't do it. No, I wouldn't you know? do that. I'm cool and I like a lot of stuff, but I, that I just, it's just too uncomfortable. Well, you certainly are cool. Very cool. Thank you. Yes. Super cool. I hey, try. maybe we'll host that show together. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pitch you, man. I'm going to totally pitch you. That'd be so fun to work every day and look at drum lines yeah. and stuff. That'd be I'm so down. fun. down. And I used to be in the DCI heavy. When I was in high school, I used to watch, you know, the Caballeros and who else? Uh, the ones from Santa Clara North. Vanguard. Santa Clara, all of them. Like, I used to watch it kind of religiously because I was marching in, in high school. Incredible. So, yeah, and hey, so, so yeah, are people, if, um, if people want you to compose, if they want you to band lead, if they want you to play tracks, to do a session, teach them, how do people find you the most efficient way? GordonCampbell.com and make sure it's Gordon with an E. G-O-R-D-E-N. Yeah. yeah. C -A -M -P -P Instagram handle? Yes, yeah, so I was going to say that's my second way, probably more so because my website was down for years. And I just brought it back up, and I'm bringing it up more as an artist, so I'm taking my time building it out. Hey, but Brian it is Delaney like, can help you with that. I actually have a friend who shot yeah. my album cover that does that does websites. So that's, that's we're like sure. in the yeah. So, but I'm in the I'm, I'm in the third there. incarnation of my website. You know, I mean, it's it's just kind of a necessary evil, I guess. I yeah. mean, I th I feel like we get more work done connecting with people on social media, but when someone says, "What's your website?" and you don't have one. They look at right. you a little, a little, little funny, exactly. right? So, it's, so I got the, the front page up. You can click on it, get my album. You can also email me there too. Fantastic. But yeah, my IG is the way. That's I'm on that all day. And that's yeah. just Gordon, G-O-R-D-E-N 512. Gordon 512. Beautiful. Be a DM, whatever. I do all styles. I Whatever. You need me to play, produce, 
I've done some country stuff too with a friend of mine. Yeah. I can't think of the artist's name. I'm sure you would know her name. Well, I'm going to suggest certain things that you may also be able to get into as well as maybe uh, teaching people about these NFTs as you come to learn more about them. Yes. People and probably pay you a premium to learn. Yes. Well, that's what, that's this week. I said, I'm yeah. doing a deep dive this week into the NFT. I'm in that's a crypto awesome. group. So we have a text group. Some of the guys that I march with at Howard, we've yeah. been meeting up over, over the thing. And it's been drummers from the seventies that marched in the seventies all the way up to the present band. And actually some of them, because Kamala Harris graduated from Howard, oh. they had the Howard university. It was supposed to be the marching band and the inaugural parade, but it was really because of COVID. It was just the drummers certain amount of drummers, some dancers and the flags, and that was it. So all the way to these guys that just marched last week, we all talk. But within us, there's a group of older guys that's in the crypto. They put me in the text thread. So every time something happens, you know, I'm learning from them. If I have a question, I'm like, sorry, how does this work? How do you know? Yeah. yeah. I got to so, learn about that. I, I, I want to do one stock. I've never had much faith in it. But uh, hey, if that could no it open up and you get lucky on one of them, whoo. Dude, we, we should have bought Netflix because, I mean, we were early Netflix adopters, Courtney and I. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, back when, you know, they were delivering DVDs, you know, we'd get them in 2001, 2002. Me too. Should have bought that stock. My yeah. gosh. That's the thing is that, you know, if you're going to buy stock, buy stuff you use. That's, that's yeah. a Warren Buffett rule. That's a rule. Yeah, I was going to say that's a rule. Buy stuff. Apple. Yes, Apple all day. Yeah. I actually have stock in Apple. I bought it from my daughter. <laughs> For one of my one of her Christmas gifts a couple years ago mm -hmm. was Apple, and it's just sitting there. I haven't even, you know, I have. have to, you, uh, I just have bought you, a have, fraction of it. Have you? Yeah, it's, it's all you can do because it's so expensive. But I mean, yeah. have you looked into Tony Robbins' uh, no, theories yeah. and 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 what he's been talking about lately? He's just talking about index funds. Really? Yeah, like buying the S and P and all that stuff. I mean, it's yeah. it's affordable. Yeah. So. I listened to a, a group of guys, uh, two guys called Earn Your Leisure. They really came mm -hmm. up since the pandemic because everybody's at home online. They yeah. do YouTubes. They do Market Mondays every Monday, and they bring in different investors. That's where I saw Mark Cuban talking about his NFTs. <laughs> he was on there. But, so I watched them. They talk about stocks every Monday, which ones to get into. Um, they'll go from like the basics of if you've never traded before, how to get started, to the super heavy if you're already in, this is the ones that get in, get out, you know, it's pretty cool. So yes, I need to look in Tony Robbins too. Okay. I'm checking this all out. I've learned so much. And, and to all the listeners out there, guys, you got to support Gordon. He's got a uh, first solo record called Conversations. And the best way to support him is at bandcamp.com. Look up Gordon Campbell. It's G-O-R-D-E-N. It's a killer record. And uh, reach out to Gordon, man. He'll get back to you Please. with uh, an answer to your questions. Like, what kind of ride symbol is that? I mean, he will answer your question, man. And there it is right there. It is beautiful. That is a Thank man. You. You're looking fly, man. Did you get a stylist for that? What'd you do? No, I have style. I just don't use it every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Me too. That story behind the hat is classic too. My friend Sharice who shot that yeah. who also does my website. Yeah. I was in DC doing a gig and um, afterwards she's like, just stay here and we'll shoot the album cover at her place in DC. We went to Howard together. Um, so we're looking for a hat all day. We're in Georgetown. We're in Maryland. We're looking everywhere. I called one of my friends that I went to Howard with. A lot of my friends still live in D.C. Um, once they graduated. And he's like the fashion guru. So he's like, I got like five, ten hats. I'll just send you pictures. I'll just, and it wasn't what I wanted. She kept saying all day, well, my dad has a, a hat at the house. Like, we can check that. But I'm like, all right, well, let's look everywhere. We literally looked until every store in D.C. closed. It was like maybe 10 o'clock that night. We get to her house. I fall asleep. Um, by the time she's like, you ready to shoot? I'm like, yeah. She's like, well, this is my dad's hat. We didn't find a hat. Try this hat on. That's the hat that made the album cover. Yeah. Her nice. dad, he was like, man, that kind of looks like my hat. <laughs> she was like, that is your hat. <laughs> so I had to give him credit on the album. But, yeah, that's where that hat came from. But everything else, I do like the dress. I'm a New Yorker, so, you know, we're kind of fashionable yeah. in it. But I most of the time, it's like, eh. I'm trying to just pay the bills. I, you know, and I, in recent <laughs> years, I, I'm always trying to dress to impress. And you have to. You in have this, to. In this COVID thing, man, I rediscovered the the, the hoodie, and I'm yeah. just like, why have I not had more of these, man? These are great. Yeah, he's, <laughs> Gordon, Gordon's wearing one right now. Yeah. <laughs> Gary V made them very stylish. Yeah, yeah. Gary V. I follow him mm -hmm. too. 
I actually got into the Goran Brothers, the hats. You know the uh, yeah, the Goran Brothers hats. So I got a couple of those too. So I almost wore one today. But I was like, uh, I didn't wear it. I went down there because our friend Jason Sutter is, is pretty pretty darn stylish. And he said, go check out the Gorn. I went down there and I was like, I'm not a hat guy, man. You know, I got a full head of hair. I'm just going to rock that, you know. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Nobody knows me as a hat guy, but I'm like, I need to, as an artist, you got to, you know, turn it up a little bit. Yeah, for sure. So. And to 11. Today, I was rushing, so I, I just threw this on because I was rushing today. But no, like, man, I, I, I'm so I'm happy great. that you're here sharing your insights, man, and you have changed the world of music, and uh, you're continuing to do it, man, and uh, just gracing the world with your talent, and congratulations on the new record, and uh, everybody go out there and get also Secrets of a Working Drummer. It's a great DVD. Is that a digital format now as well, or just the hard Yeah, copy? Jake, they can go to Hudson Music and get it, HudsonMusic.com. Perfect. And you yeah, get my book at myself. the Hudson Music. <laughs> there you go. Hudson Music is the way to go. For sure, man. Thanks so much for joining yeah, us today, bud. Thank you for having me. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And I can't wait to see you again. And uh, Jim, thank yep. you for all that you do. And to all the listeners out there, i got an email address for you, therichredmanshow at gmail.com. You could send praise and criticism to Jim and I. We prefer praise. And if it's a really thoughtful letter, we'll read it on the air and we'll send you some door prizes. And as always, be sure to subscribe, share, rate the show, review the show. It really does help make a difference. There's literally one million podcasts and we want to be found. And to all the true believers out there, thanks for the support of so so far, 110 episodes. We do appreciate it. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Jim. Sir. Yes. All right. This has been the Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com forward slash podcasts.